Good morning. Another day for Australia. Another day for Osman Khawaja. This is Ask George. How many acts? Has there ever been a more impressive return to Test cricket than, than that of Osman Khawaja? Oh, I don't know what. Statistically, I've no idea. But uh, it was a fantastic return, wasn't it? Well, it was a brilliantly eloquent return. He is very, very easy on the eye. Uh, and uh, it seems to be unthinkable that he won't play in the next test. But imagine, imagine being able to lose players and have someone come in who's already got more runs than most of the England players have combined since the dawn of time. I mean, it, it's brilliant. So they've got nothing but respect for him. Um, you know, really, really well played. It's, it's extraordinary, isn't it? Ten test hundreds, two and a half years without a test. Um, England would kill to be in a position where they could leave him out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's unthinkable, really. All I would say is that I don't want to take anything away because I thought he's a lovely batter and he, and he got through his periods of real pressure. Towards the end of the second innings, you know, the last few runs before he got his 100. You know, if people aren't very good at hunting and they tie a goat to a peg and just let them shoot it. Who was the who was the bowler? I mean, was it Milan again? Milan, yeah, was Milan, Milan yeah. bowled each time when he got his hundred. You know, he, he, at, at the period. But that yeah. doesn't I mean, really doesn't mean that churlishly. It's just that he earned the opportunity to face that by breaking England down. He did. He completely ground mm. them down. They looked utterly exhausted today. And he earned, he earned the second hundred by getting the first. If ultimately we take away, if we take away his first innings hundred, yeah. I, mean, I know this is how cricket works. But if you take away his 130 odd, we've actually got an even game, haven't we? So if you get your 130 in the first innings and push your team 130 runs ahead, I guess you deserve those. I guess you deserve to nudge those few into the leg side off Dad Milan when you're when you're in the 90s and England are shot to pieces, one bowler down. He definitely deserves it. And I say this knowing that it will annoy people, but in a way, it will annoy the people that we really should enjoy annoying. Now, there was something quite uh, lovely about the reception he got. You know, in England and Australia, uh, cricket has been churning over racial and inclusion matters over recent times. The reception he's had here, you know, really, really positive. And in the same way that I'm sure that, well, I grew up watching Bib Richards in Somerset, or a generation of people who grew up watching John Barnes in Liverpool. You're not going to grow up being racist if you're heroes. A different colour from you. I think that's a very healthy, positive thing, you know, in a general way. And, you know, watch the tweets I get about that comment. Mm. Let's 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 stay with Kawaja. Um, as you said, it seems unthinkable he won't play the next test. For him to play the next test, I guess we're assuming Travis Head rightly comes back in. On obviously got 100 at Brisbane. So, and Marcus Harris, as much as he's been the second best opener in the series. Um, almost certainly hasn't done enough to, to keep his spot. So when Kawaja, I think, averages, I think it's 96.8, I think, opening the batting in Test cricket. So he's done it before, he's done it all right. Malik asks if he will open alongside Dave Warner. I assume the answer is a resounding yes. Yeah, well, I think, look, he was asked in the press conference at the close of play, and he said, oh, no, I'm not expected to play. And he would say that because he's a nice fellow. He actually doesn't need to do any talking with his mouth because he's done it all with the bat and he doesn't want to put his teammates under any pressure. So that was the classy thing to say. But it would be unthinkable not to pick him. Yeah, he's, he's a better player than Harris. Oh, mm. Aren't Australia lucky to have such depth? Hmm, quite. Um, last time we watched Ollie Pope keep wicket in Test cricket, it, it, I, feel, I feel like it went quite differently. Um, how, how impressed were you with with him. Danny asked if Wally Pope is a better keeper than Josh Butler up the stumps. So I'd, I'd like to start by just widening it and say how how impressed were you by him? I thought apart from one very difficult half chance, he was pretty exemplary, really. Is Pope better than Butler? Up to the stumps. The Pope is better than Butler standing up to the stumps. How good, how good was Ollie today? He took a couple of uh, sort of athletic naturally skillful chances. I think uh, 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 someone with much more knowledge on this subject than me would, <laughs> would suggest that maybe there were some, you know, it was raw talent rather than technique and you probably want to have both. But he did really, really well and it would be churlish to say anything else. He did really, really well. And, uh, if they were both fit tomorrow, I'd rather he did it than Bala. 
We've got to move on from Butler. It's a ridiculous situation at this stage. It's just stubbornness. They've had a real punch on him and it hasn't worked. Anyway, he's injured, so he's not going to be able to play the next test. I'm sure he won't play the next test. I guess um, we'll Pope as well to... And, to, to and I think he'll even probably will. Hmm. You know, I guess... You know, because this, so Pope has kept in six first-class games. Sorry, that's not true. He has been a designated keeper in six first-class games. He would have kept in a few more. So he is extremely inexperienced. And it's telling that he isn't doing it for Surrey. You know, he's hmm. at least third choice at Surrey, isn't he, behind Boach and Smith. But, but you know, he, he, he was asked to come in and do a job as a stand-in, and he did terrifically well. And maybe it will have helped him feel more at ease at this level with the bat. I mean, it's not impossible he could get a recall next week. So um, he did really, really well. He, he had very good reactions. It was interesting because he was a very good short leg, wasn't it? Wasn't he? Mm. And I think he's already taken more chances standing up to the stumps in this series than Butler. Um, yeah, so nothing but praise. There, there was a, a take as well where it didn't look as if Root had told him. I might be wrong. But Root fired in a bouncer, which was a bit of a surprise. Yes, last ball session. And he took it one-handed. You know, he was clearly surprised that it wasn't exactly how Jack Russell or Alan Knott or someone might have taken it. But, you know, it ended up in the middle of the club. So uh, he did really, really well. I, I'm not sure that this means that he should be England's keeper. No. But uh, no, he, he, he's proved not. his worth in a way when his team needed it. My glasses, can England draw or win? Well, sure they can. Which one? <laughs> well, I don't think they'll do either. But, uh, you know, the, the, the win would be, you know, I think I've said in my uh, piece that it would be like winning the lottery. I mean, it happens. People do it. But, you know. Uh, I would be very impressed by them if they drew. It would be a good effort. They would have to bat longer than they have at any time in the series. We know that three of them are injured. Three of the top seven are injured. And, and you know, really quite injured. Mm. Um, so it would be a terrific effort against a, a good good attack. So um, on, on a pitch which is going up and down. So I would expect Australia to win. But you know, the glorious uncertainty of sport is that it surprises us all the time. And, um, well, they started really well this evening, so fair play. It would be uh, a delight to be proved wrong by them tomorrow. But I mean, you know, talking about the winning is, you know, I mean, whoever said that, I, I would like to sell them some double glazing. <laughs> we know if do we know if the injured trio are all obviously Stokes was on the field and Bear they're Stokes all gonna sand, bat. they're all going to bat, are they? Um, Tom Vickers asks. I think, I think the expression. Well, I think the expression was that all batted required, which is. <laughs> um, you mentioned that you mentioned the opening stand. Tom Vickers asks, "Is it bad that an unbeaten opening stand lasting eleven overs feels like a massive achievement?" Okay, um, it did. Yeah, it felt like a massive achievement. Okay, so so they're starting at a low base, and um, yeah, and we have low expectations for them. But they did get through, and actually, they've got through two tricky little evening sessions twice this game. So those are little signs of improvement, aren't they? And, and it wasn't like they were lucky. You know, they did it They did it well. Uh, so, yeah, a step in the right direction, eh? There's got to be an acceptance, something that, you, that you're going to face, good, I mean, especially from this attack, as an opening batter, that you can't... If England do go one or two down, it's not... You can't always put it down to batsman error or batsman, you know, uh, not being up to scratch. Often, you know, even that one that Crawley sort of managed to sort no, of look, guide they're, over they're, the cord and it's... Crack. They're, they're, they bowl good balls. <laughs> and, and, and there's an element of chance in the wicket at this stage because there's variable bounce. And that doesn't mm. necessarily just reward merit, but that's what happens if you win the toss and take advantage by putting it together a big mm. in score. I mean, that's, that's the game of cricket, isn't it? Mm. Uh, so, yeah, uh, uh, they, they have their work cut out. But, um, yeah, so, as I say, it, it was a step in the right direction. They did all the right things. Um, Crawley is very, very easy on the eye. It's a fair hmm. bit to like that. Yeah. Um, Nanda asks, I guess this is sort of looking at what happens if if and when we go one down. Do England miss a stonewaller like Chetua Pajara who can bat and bat? Is there yeah. is there any such player they could have added to the touring party? I feel like we've covered this in previous <laughs> post-mortems, but... Um, I mean, yes, I mean, of course there, there, there are... Well, I mean, they can't add to the tour party now. For all those people who say every day, by the Lions here. I mean, you can't just keep people in these bubbles forever. Mm. It's very unpleasant in lots of ways, very expensive. 
they wouldn't have played really anyway. And it's very hard to travel. You need a government exemption to travel. Mm. You know, the world number one is unable to, you know, a tennis player is struggling to get in for various reasons, of course. Uh, so you can't, it's not the same as when you just used to get someone to jump on a plane and get here. They have to do a quarantine period, they have to have PCR tests, which have to be cleared. It's very difficult, you know, travel is very difficult. In an ideal world, England were planning for Dom Sibley to play, weren't they, in this series? You know, an obdurate, mm. occupy the crease kind of player. And he lost form horrendously. And so they had to leave him out. But that's the sort of person you mean. Look, again and again, there, there are people out there, you know, Alex Lees, I'm sure, will come into the squad mm. of the Caribbean. I don't think there are quick fixes. It's not as simple as, oh, they picked one or two people or made the wrong decision on winning the toss. Well, Stuart Broad put it really well the other day. People are like, oh, why did England pick Broad at Brisbane? They're out for 147. And, and, you know, people say they made the wrong decision at the toss. Well, it's the same decision Pat Cummins would have made. Hmm. So, you know, uh, there aren't quick solutions. It doesn't mean that they've got everything right. I'm not suggesting that. It doesn't mean that the people in positions, Root and Silver, are necessarily the solution. That's fine. But you can change those people. You can call up a different set of players. They're still going to lose. Because the fundamental problem will remain unless someone has the courage for a change of the guard in lots of other ways. You know, you don't want me to bore you with all these views again. As um, Can I chuck Dom Sibley back at you? As a, as a, speaking as a Dom Sibley fan who, um, to go back two years, you know, was, as you say, so it was picked very much with this series in mind, someone that could leave the ball on length, um, wouldn't fiddle around outside off stump, and to be fair, probably wouldn't have got out you know, in, in certainly in the manner that we've seen a lot of the, the England top order lose their wickets in these first three and a half games. I mean, he batted, we, we saw him bat for a day in South Africa, we saw him bat for a day in West Indies, in India, um, often not even for 100 in that day. You know, he batted for, I think, 87 again in, in China, didn't he? Um, and then we obviously saw, saw him get his hundreds as well. Given, yes, he lost form, but could they have handled that situation better? I mean, Chuck, are we, is it safe to say that had he been in the, been named in the squad rather than the Lions tour, he might be here and therefore, because I mean, ultimately, and obviously with Zach Crawley, and he's not, you know, Sibley's not the only player who, who lost form and was, left, and was left out of that side, you know, later on in the summer. And certainly in Hamid, they sort of replaced him with a simil similarly obdurate, I guess, player, albeit with what a lot of people would say is a less suitable technique for these conditions. I mean, could, could they've handled the well, situation well. better? Milan's done yeah, well, absolutely. Yeah, hasn't he? Or, or he's, done, he's, he's done better than the others anyway. I mean, we're setting the bar low again by saying Milan's done well, but he has had two decent innings. Um, but could, could they have, could they have yeah, managed the Sibley situation it's slightly more in a more nuanced fashion, I guess, than they, than they did? Yeah, but maybe, but you would have to say, and I say this as a Sibley fan, that he did warrant his dropping. Mm. You know, he, well, I guess so did, but so did Crawley. It, yes, he did, and he didn't really warrant coming back. But there were a couple of differences um, that Crawley was sort of dropped. So good to get him mentally frazzled, I think. Simply think. He, he looks like he got very confused. His, his great strength, that actually burns his strength as well, is not nicking off. They're mm. actually very, very good at that when they're, when they're playing well. But it may be, he, he looks to me as if, well, I'm sure he was in between techniques and he had lost his strength because he had become scoreless. And I think that uh, when players, you see it all the time, I mean, all the time, when players are the focus of a lot of media criticism, particularly from Sky, when they're seeing their game picked apart, they start to doubt themselves, they lose their strengths, they develop more weaknesses, and that's the phase he was going through. So as a Sibley's supporter, I didn't think it was unreasonable. I thought he probably needed to be taken out of the firing line. I think he then asked to not go on the Lions tour. He asked for time to work on his game, mm. which suggests that he accepts. And I'm told that's going very well. Uh, it suggests that he accepts that... Um, the, you know, there, there was a need to go back to basics a little bit. The other thing is, I think there is a, um, to go back to the question about yeah. Pujara, I, I mean, a lot of India supporters criticised Pujara. Mm. Uh, and I said that it, it would be a lot worse in England because I think there is an even more uh, prevalent 
theory about the need to strike some blows. I don't know if you saw, but I had a chat with um, Foxy Fowler on Twitter today. It would be there if people want to read it. And I remember him saying to me ages and ages ago, we're talking about his 200 in uh, Chennai, it was. And he, I, I think he, he told me he faced six or seven maidens in a row. I like it. You know, it, it might be hard for him, but the bowlers have to hold the earth. It's even harder, you know, they're having to run up and stuff. So he just saw them off and wore them down and picked off runs. And that has gone out of the game to a, an alarming extent. I, I, I forever bemoan the language of, you've got to be positive, you've got to score some runs before a ball gets you, you've got to throw some punches back. No, you don't. Wear the buckers out. Do that. That's what, that's what happened for years. And it's actually what Australia have done in this series. They've played old-fashioned, nutritional test cricket. Now, if you turn on a highlights package, you'll see them smash it in with the round, but that's because they've earned the right to do it through hours of patience and determination. So I think Warner's produced the slowest 50 in his test career this series. I think uh, Steve Smith produced very, very slow 50s. And that's a shame to sort of produce a, a real ugly, workmanlike 100 at Adelaide because they're prepared to dig deep and get dirty. So I, I, I would like to see England adopt a entirely different sort of terminology and mentality. Basically just, you know, going back to basics, there's nothing wrong with defending. There's this idea that you're under pressure and you place lots of babies. You don't have to be. Just change the mentality. Think about the bowler getting tired. It's not harder than bowl than bat, sure. Mm. And leading into that, leading from that into the into a final question from James, who who <laughs> I'm scared of even asking this. What can the ECB change to the county game to improve the national side? Or is that is that one for its own episode? You know, I, I mean, how, you know, how, how much room does the internet have? <laughs> I, I don't want to, uh, to bore people by repeating all the same things. So I'll just say this. Value it. The ECB stopped valuing their own domestic competition so well. Their, certainly their, their main domestic first-class competition several years ago. They stopped respecting it. You know, they play it at the time of the season with very hard for ground staffs to prepare decent pitches, not necessarily the ground staffs for Um They have, oh, they've done a million things. Basically, if you get the domestic game right, if you focus nearly everything on domestic game, the international team is the pyramid on top of it. You know, it's the, it's the top of the pyramid and it almost takes care of itself. So uh, I'll make this point so that you can read all the other stuff I've written on about it if you're interested. When England won here in 2010-11, they had four members of the top seven who had scored centuries on the test debut. Uh, uh, Cook, Strauss, Schrott, Pryor. Okay? Two others, KP and Bell, scored 50s. They had a, a fast bowler, Jimmy Anderson, who had taken five for the day. He had a spinner who took two wickets in his first over. At least one of them was dragging. So they had, my point being, a uh, domestic competition which prepared people, you know, tangibly, that is proof that it prepared people for the higher level. Well, now look at the struggles that people are having to move up to the higher level. I, mean, I don't think, I think Ben Folkes has the highest average of anyone to play for England, to make their debut for England in the last six or seven years, and he's averaging 31. Of the batters, not a single specialist battery averages as much as 31. So the county game isn't doing that, but I don't blame the county game, I blame the ECB for devaluing the county game. And, and there are all sorts of reasons, you know, I, I've read, written rather. I was going to say a thousand pieces, and they'd say that's an exaggeration, but only by a bit. Uh, lots of reasons. Uh, I'll say again that um, people basically know what needs to be done. They just have the courage, need to have the courage to do it. If they really care about test cricket, rather than say it, they really care about test cricket. You could do it almost immediately. But again, the 100 is a great tour sitting in the middle of the English season. Because I don't care whether you could get rid of T20 and play it over 100 balls. I, I can live with that. I, I really don't care about that. What I care about is the window. I don't care what's in the window. But if you have a window, you're prioritising. And they are prioritising white ball cricket. And the language of coaching is predominantly about white ball cricket. The technique of coaching is mainly about white ball cricket. White ball cricket's great, I love it. Not not saying it's better than test cricket. I love, I love it all. But uh, yeah, they've, they've got that wrong and they, they need to have the courage to, to go back. I think, by the way, that I heard a very interesting interview with Thanos, the Worcestershire chair, overnight. And he reckoned that the 100 was worth about 15% of broadcasting. 15%. Which means that England cricket 
is worth basically, probably well, 85%, 80% maybe, um, certainly a huge amount. And test cricket is the dominant side of that. So all these resources that are going towards the 100, it's, it's not even good finance. It's, it's honestly, I think, it's mainly about ego. The, the one thing I've been really interested, the one, one of the things I've learned in cricket over the last 20 years is that it's not been greed very often that has uh, run the game, that ruled the game. It's been ego. There's been huge egos in positions of power. Giles Clark, awful graves man. And, and now the people behind the hundreds who are so desperate to see their competition justify itself. But of course they get big fat bonuses. It's a ridiculous situation. People on the ECB board, and I know at least one of them is what will be watching this. What are you doing? If you're on a big position like that, a national governing body, and you see this shambles, and you see that uh, all the resources going towards a competition that no one asked for and no one would want, really you should be looking at yourself and saying, hmm, maybe I haven't done a very good job of overseeing what's going on in the game. It's shambles. So, you know, I have ranted there, having said I wasn't going to, uh, but it's only because I care. Uh, and actually, I think everyone knows that these things could be corrected pretty easily, but it would take people in positions of power to swallow their pride and their ego.